Hey all you cats and kittens and all you non-binary fittens, it's your boy, D. Biddles. Welcome to Chatbots. Now hopefully you've seen my content before, but based on view counts and the number of return viewers I have, statistically you haven't. So I'd like to start with a quick rundown of my deal. Namely, that I assemble model kits of anime robots, I chat about those robots, and then I chat about some bigger topic that's related in some way to the robot. And, uh, yeah, that's about it. I've done a number of these videos so far, so if and you'd be so kind as to give me a thumbs up and a sub, and maybe check out some of that other content after this video, I'd be much obliged. But in the meanwhile, we have today's selected robot, namely the Scope Dog, Red Shoulder Custom, from the series Armor Trooper Vautums. Now it's kind of become customary in mecha series is to not refer to the robots in the series as robots. It's not a hard and fast rule, more of a trope, like cool guys not looking at explosions in action movies. Mecha usually gets some kind of technical term unique to the universe from whence they come. You know, they're not robots, they're mobile suits, they're Evangelion units, they're Mazines, they're gunmen, they're variable fighters, they're aura battlers, etc. However, in Vodums, the word Vodums is hardly ever used. They're typically referred to as ATs, or armored troopers. But whenever the word Vodums is used, it deliberately makes use of the Japanese tendency to muddle the pronunciation of the letter V with the letter B, to pronounce it as Bottoms. And this kind of feeds into the themes of that series, which are also reflected in the design of the armored troopers themselves. Vodums takes place in a universe that has had a galaxy-spanning war going on for a literal century. The hows and the whys of this war are long forgotten, if they were ever known at all, and so much of the societies on either side of this war revolve pretty centrally around said war. Anyone familiar with Robert Heinlein's novel Starship Troopers, or the famous movie adaptation that gives it a satirical tone, will find the world of Vodums strikingly similar. It's very much a fascist dystopian nightmare world where human lives are utterly disposable and serve only to feed the mindless grind of unending combat all in the name of a literal eugenics program that seeks to seat an ubermensch forged in battle upon a throne as a literal god emperor of the galaxy who will oversee the perpetual warfare. Oh hey, Warhammer 40k has entered the chat. One of the reasons I really strongly gravitate to mecha anime in particular is that Japan has a very different perspective on war than the US typically does. Having suffered a pretty devastating loss in World War II, courtesy of the current reigning world champ of military spending, their national ego took a pretty mighty blow and it helped to de-glamorize the notion of warfare and escalating power struggles in the eyes of the younger generations. I don't know, something about being the first country on earth to be hit by weapons of mass destruction, two of them no less, on non-combatants in major metropolitan areas no less, it kind of makes you a little more fatalistic about the notion of having to take up arms against your fellow man. Anyone who's seen Devilman Crybaby might have been shocked by the decidedly dark ending, but like, does it really surprise anyone that apocalypses, mass destruction, and needless cruelty are a frequent plot point in a lot of anime given the real life history of Japan? I mean, I could list the titles that feature massive catastrophic life-ending Armageddon as a major plot element. Evangelion, Fist of the North Star, Godzilla, Akira, Vampire Hunter D, Naruto, DBZ, MHA, FMA, so many, many others. You can probably think of a few yourself. America tends to lionize armed combat and soldiers, mostly as a means of manufacturing consent for perpetuating the military-industrial complex. And not all, but a lot of our media tends to reflect that. Battle of the Bulge, Independence Day, 300, Glory, Red Dawn, Top Gun, Call of Duty, Halo, Gears of War, basically all the Rambo movies after the first one, you get it. They're all featuring themes of honor and duty and the willingness to carry on in the name of protecting God and country. And like... I don't know, man. Kind of feels like if we're going to war in some fashion again, we kind of fucked up somewhere along the way. Americans are always saying stuff like, support our troops. But it seems to me that the best way to do that isn't parades and hats and saluting the flag and buying dinner for veterans whom you happen to encounter at TGI Fridays. 
It should rather be passing legislation to treat former soldiers coming home from war and working towards not needing to go to war in the future. There's nothing glamorous or honorable about war. Every time you have an embattled nation fighting to protect its independence and sovereignty, that means there's someone on one or both sides who's decided that the state's own personal goals are more important than the lives of everyone who's going to get caught in the middle. And bringing this back to Vodums, this is perfectly represented in the design of the Scope Dog, which is way high up on my tier list of mecha designs. Unlike many of its contemporaries in the mecha genre, the Scope Dog is decidedly plain and functional in its aesthetics, which really help to differentiate the emerging real robot subgenre from the super robot subgenre. Unlike the bright primary colors of the super robots, it sports a plain olive drab. Although this variant features the infamous red shoulder, denoting the squadron of elite soldiers enlisted for special ops, all of whom are burdened by the weight of blood from their many kills. Instead of wings and pointed shoulders and a headpiece that resembles a crown or a Kabuto-style samurai helmet, it's squat and rounded, evoking imagery of American GIs, or Wehrmacht soldiers, or Japan's Type 92 Tetsubo, or even World War I troops who huddled in trenches. And instead of a face, or a face shield, or a V-fin, it sports its namesake Scope, a single cyclopean eye. It's a dehumanizing visage, and a literal and figurative symbol of tunnel vision. It forces the soldier within to only see their objective, only see their enemy, and pay no attention to everything around them, be that the carnage of their fallen peers, the destruction they wreak upon the galaxy, or the systems that manipulate them like pawns. Similar characteristics are present in the Xeon mobile suits in Gundam. And let's not forget the naming. Vodums. Bottoms. Indicative of their status in this world. Crammed into tin cans to go out and get shot. The fuel that powers them prone to ignite from sudden impacts thus minimizing the chance for survival should you receive damage in the field, and scope dogs. Further reiterating this lonely, dehumanizing, unquestioningly obedient status, it also brings to mind Antony's line in Shakespeare's play Julius Caesar. A curse shall light upon the limbs of men. Domestic fury and fierce civil strife shall cumber all the parts of Italy. Blood and destruction shall be so in use, and dreadful objects so familiar that mothers shall but smile when they behold their infants quartered with the hands of war, all pity choked with custom of fell deeds, and Caesar's spirit, ranging for revenge, with Ate by his side, come hot from hell, shall in these confines with a monarch's voice cry havoc, and let slip the dogs of war that this foul deed shall smell above the earth with carrion men groaning for burial. Just like with most of the mecha shows I talk about, I don't want to spoil too much of Autumn's as it's well worth the watch, and the complete series and many of its associated OVAs are available on Blu-ray from Made in Japan slash Sentai Filmworks. But this constant struggle with the identity of that of a mindless killing machine is one of the central internal conflicts of main character Kiriko Kuvi, one not aided by the many, many external conflicts he must face on his journey. Is he a man? Or is he just the ultimate murderer that his authoritarian, warmongering society has conditioned him to be his entire life? In a society dedicated to bloodshed, is not the man who can shed the most from others while shedding least his own not worthy of dominating? Is there not some paradox at play when those in charge desire the most powerful soldiers to serve them whilst clinging to some arbitrary and archaic notion of their worthiness to lead? There's all manner of forces in the Astragius galaxy that seem to want to decide Kiriko's fate for their own benefit, regardless of what he wants. Because that's what fascists do. They reduce your identity down to that of some random genetic qualities of birth that make you different than everyone else make you better than everyone else, make you worthy of destroying or subjugating everyone else because of your arbitrary position on the social hierarchy that values hegemonic adherence to arbitrary qualities. To the fascist, 
You're not an individual. You have no value based on your personhood. Your only value is in maintaining the hierarchy, in serving the system. You're special because you're part of the in-group, the master race. Why does that matter? Because it's the group that keeps all the inferior groups in their place. Maybe the inferior groups have subverted the natural order and are now existing as equals to you, or worse yet, have subjugated you through some sort of trickery so that all the weak people, the unworthy, get to have stuff, get to have more than their unworthiness entitles them to. But you can be part of the effort to put them back where they belong. You can only prove your individual value by clawing your way to the top of the hierarchy, by pushing down others or tearing down those who get in your way. And that dynamic exists within the in-group as well as between the groups. True order necessitates the rule of the strong. I mean, could you imagine if we just took care of everyone equally? Pfft, so stupid. How would the special people get what they deserve? The Ubermensch who thwarts his fellow Ubermenschen, surely he and he alone is worthy of enacting his own will upon the world. It's all about the hierarchy. It's all about categorizing everyone as worthy and unworthy. It's all about tier listing people. And surely the most worthy are the ones on top because they had the strength to get there. Might makes right. Because to cater to or even provide consolation for those on the bottom would suggest that they have some kind of inherent right to exist, to thrive, despite their weakness, despite them having done less to succeed. And you wouldn't want those less than you to have the same rights and privileges as you, right? What would even be the point of excelling, of succeeding, if everyone is treated equal? If you don't get to be special? What kind of just world would permit those lesser than you to be treated equally? And uh, speaking of authoritarian dehumanization that serves only hierarchy and hegemony, let's move on to our main topic. Uh, but before that, might I recommend that you go back and watch my 4th, 5th, and 6th episodes featuring the VF1 Valkyrie, Line Barrel, and Guy King respectively? It's not strictly necessary, but I think that their content might be relevant to today's topic just a little bit. And I'm not going to do that thing I normally do where I call out having mentioned this or that thought or idea in those videos. But just bear in mind that much of what I'm about to say is somewhat relevant to those ideas or builds off them. So you're really doing yourself a disservice by not having watched those first. Also, a quick TW for talk about assault later in the video, sexual assault. Uh, just a heads up, but we're gonna bring up some non-consensual topics later. This is your one warning. So if that's not for you, thanks for stopping by. We'll see you next time. Anyone familiar with the term meritocracy? It's a system in which people who are the most able and talented are rewarded and permitted to rule. It's the belief that the people who are the smartest and strongest and most successful are the best qualified to lead us. Which, yeah, it kind of makes sense. Uh, you don't want dum-dums and ninnies doing important stuff like uh, building our bridges or making our medicine or being in charge of really important shit. You want the people most qualified doing the most difficult and important stuff because if they fuck up, then bad things could happen. But being in charge of things is different than doing important jobs. Being in charge requires a different skill set. And how, in our modern world, do we decide success? How do we know who's the smartest and strongest? Well, typically, it's money, baby. That green stuff, that gold stuff, that stuff that you can trade for everything. You only get money by working really hard, having great ideas, being smart, and seizing opportunities, or so the thinking goes. So obviously, if you've got lots of money, you're the most worthy of it because you must have contributed more value than your average person. And obviously, if you've got enough money, that means you can have whatever you want. Everything on Earth costs something, whether that's a loaf of bread, or the shirt on your back, or the roof over your head, or the land your roof is built on, it all has a cost. So if you've worked really hard, you're entitled to have what you want. I mean, you're so important to our society, 
We ought to make you happy, right? Meritocracy kind of goes hand in hand with another commonly held belief, the just world philosophy. The just world philosophy basically is the belief that whether it's man-made systems or the cosmic karma of the universe, eventually everyone will get what they rightfully deserve, that good actions will be rewarded and that bad actions will be punished, both proportionate to their measure. This philosophy also comes with the implication that you can work backwards from the outcome to determine the righteousness of the means. So, for example, How can you say David Ayer's Suicide Squad wasn't a great film? Look at how much money it made! Not like that James Gunn woke garbage blockbuster bomb, The Suicide Squad. That was terrible. I mean, look at its box office returns. As you might imagine, this sort of belief is quite popular among theists, people who believe in gods and their divine will. In those sorts of belief systems, there's an additional level of just world, because if you don't face your reward or punishment in this life, don't you worry, God will sort you out in the next life. God's definitely going to make sure that this all makes sense, so don't fret. The seemingly endless parade of random injustices are all part of the plan, and your four-year-old niece with terminal cancer is actually going to have good things happen to her, while that miserly old ultra-wealthy skinflint Mr. Burns who laid off your brother right after your niece's diagnosis is totally going to get his due. They sound silly, but I don't know how many people consciously recognize that they subscribe to these concepts. Certainly some do knowingly embrace them, but I feel like most people don't actually believe this sort of nonsense thinking. We live in a cynical age, and I feel like generally we have a lot of well-earned suspicion aimed at those in positions of authority. We're very aware that the world is a lot less ideal than it should be, than it could be, and we all have strong doubts about how correctly it's all being run. I just don't know that we have enough doubts. For example, we all kind of instinctually recognize that people who relentlessly pursue wealth are not exactly trustworthy, right? Thieves, con artists, grifters, scammers, corporate interests, shadowy financiers, etc. We all kind of recognize them as enemies who spend all their time and energy pursuing wealth, consequences be damned. We almost all recognize that. We almost all see them as agents of the system that is operating contrary to our best interests, of profits over people. But for the people in organizations who are already wealthy and established powers, we just kind of assume that they got to that point through mostly justifiable and trustworthy means. Which is weird, right? Like, let's look at Elon Musk fans in particular. They all just believe the myth that he's constructed about himself. That he's a self-made, genius, billionaire, philanthropist, futurist, real-life Iron Man who's going to save the world and bring us to the next stage of technological society. But that image is slowly being chipped away little by little with every tweak and adjustment he makes to Twitter. Sorry, I, I forgot it's X now. Don't want to be accused of deadnaming a transphobe's website. I forgot that Elon literally paid like double the asking price for his favorite app and then not only made a bunch of changes that made it very user unfriendly, but he then changed the very brand name to the most generic fucking title imaginable. Like, leaving aside the fact that he's chased off advertisers, decreased the value of the site, not gotten rid of bot accounts, banned anyone who makes fun of him, brought back all the Nazis and creeps who were formerly banned just so he can very slowly and gradually ban a bunch of them all over again when he's not retweeting their shit, removed functionality from the site, most notably now the block feature, hosted the increasingly irrelevant but still notably detestable Tucker Carlson, is engaging in all manner of unethical business practices while managing the company, and about a hundred other things. Leaving all that aside, this motherfucker literally paid $44 billion to buy a well-known brand just to pitch it out the window to make his site sound like a shady source for porno. Like, imagine you bought McDonald's. You bought the entire company. And then you were just like, 
Nah, actually, I hate these golden arches and this stupid clown and the fact that we call our signature dish the Big Mac and the fact that we're a globally recognized household name and the fact that I could have built my own restaurant chain for way cheaper and just called it something different from the start if it was really that important to me. Nah, fuck all that. I want us to be called Z now. We're the restaurant chain known as Z. Surely by now we can maybe start admitting that Elon isn't some big brain mastermind who is playing 5D chess, and maybe acknowledge that the dude's kind of just an obvious dipshit with stale memes. Right about now, there's probably someone in the audience saying something like, Say, isn't this your second video about Elon? Oh man, he's living rent free inside your mind. You're just jealous because he's so rich and successful and a 10,000 IQ genius. And I gotta tell you, man, boy, have I heard that line employed by weird simps on the internet about a billion goddamn times to deflect when people make salient criticisms about very wealthy shitbags. The decisions Elon makes have very big and very real consequences to a lot of significantly less powerful people. Particularly now that he's not just the wealthy owner of several companies, but one of them as a service that millions of people use day to day, and his very hands-on approach to managing that service has had very real negative impact on the many folks using said service. And I've heard the talk about how maybe he bought Twitter to deliberately run it into the ground and, quote, bring free speech back to the country, question mark? But not only would that be an incredibly dick move to break something that so many people enjoy using, some of whom rely on it for their source of income, not only did he spend way too much money to do so, borrowing some of that way too much money, not only does that probably give him more credit for his ability to enact intricate secret plans than I think he deserves, but explain to me how one incredibly powerful man getting to dictate how millions of people use a platform, one that they apparently now have to pay for, how is that in any way free speech? And it's not just Twitter X, uh, Twix, whatever you want to call it either, but look at how Elon handled the use of Starlink in Ukraine, a service that became integral to their entire country both domestically and in dealing with the invasion from Russia, and how Elon just suddenly shut it off and started simping for Russia because he just didn't feel like the people of Ukraine appreciated him enough. Lives were lost because this unelected egomaniac with way too much fucking power started interfering in shit that he had no business meddling in. The world's richest man was suddenly big mad that a country in the middle of an invasion from a hostile power wasn't paying its bills on time. Oh, Elon's just living rent free inside your head. By that same logic, am I not allowed to criticize the president when he makes dipshit mistakes? Oh man, Joe Biden just lives rent free in the minds of all these haters. Jealous much? I feel we all have a right to be pissed when ultra-powerful figures make unilateral decisions on a whim that fuck a lot of us over. If anything, the tenets of meritocracy should mean that the more powerful a person is, the higher our expectations should be. We should be scrutinizing the world's richest man and his various fuck-ups even harder because he apparently had to meet such high standards to reach that success. Or in other words, it's no big deal if your dog starts tonguing his own asshole in front of everyone at a fancy dinner party, but if Jeff Bezos does it, I feel like we're all well within our rights to ask him to leave and not come back. And while it's not a perfect circle, the Venn diagram of Elon fans has significant overlap with the fandoms of other fairly wealthy public figures who claim to have the people's best interest in mind. Andrew Tate. Donald Trump, Jordan Peterson, Alex Jones, Matt Walsh, Tucker Carlson, Fresh and Fit, etc. A lot of the biggest Elon fans are the types of people who really like all the horrible changes he's made to Twitter to reinstate and or promote a lot of really annoying, terrible people. 
And these are all public figures for whom a lot of strong criticism and accusations have been made against them, but are all people who claim to be fighting against these shadowy powers of the powerful elite. The shadowy powerful elite that they themselves are actually kind of representative of, you might notice. I mean, Elon himself is the wealthiest man on earth. Surely that makes him a powerful elite. No, but the evil powerful elites are wealthy establishment forces that might have an interest in maintaining a status quo that is supposedly way different than the status quo that we used to have during that idealistic period of history when everything was super great and awesome, citation needed. You know, that time when uh, everything was actually really cool and no one in our society was suffering unjustly from systemic oppression? Probably back when you were a little kid and everything was totally perfect for reasons beyond you just being too young to see beyond your limited nostalgia-tainted scope? Yeah, that totally happened. Anyways, the evil powerful elites are totally responsible for the new and bad status quo. But don't worry, the good powerful elites are here and they're totally fighting for you and the normal, totally based and red-pilled status quo. And they're all people for whom hierarchy and hustle culture and the natural order of things is kind of central to their ideology, right? Power, wealth, success, they all spend their time telling you that you should have all these things, that you're entitled to them, but that there are all these insidious forces who are out to rule the world, and that those forces are insidious because they're pursuing power and wealth at your expense. Joe Biden and the Democrats cheated in the election to steal power and wealth from you. The woke agenda is trying to keep straight white men down so that they can destroy Western civilization. The feminist agenda and the queer agenda are trying to use Hollywood and the media to weaken men so that they can seize power. The Chinese are trying to destroy America. The world banking system and the DC swamp are stealing from you. The globalists, the elitists, the postmodern neo-Marxists, the radical leftists, the woke moralists, the matrix, they're all trying to seize authority through illegitimate means, but we all represent authority that was acquired through good means, and we want to make our world great again. Apparently, meritocracy is only good when the people we like are getting to be in charge through weird and arbitrary means. Not when annoying libs and feminists are in charge. That's not meritocracy. And it's an appealing proposal because it utilizes a starting point of truth that we all again kind of all already agree with. The world is fucked up. Powerful people who run the systems we all live within are not acting in our best interests and in fact are preying on us. We're all having to make do with less than we should. It's all not working how it should be, and a lot of people are getting quite drastically slighted as a result. But we want to believe that the world is naturally fair, that it's naturally good, that the systems created by our forefathers, our founding fathers, are set up to reward merit and punish injustice, and that it's just that there's some evil jerks who have ruined everything, that the American experiment is actually perfect, that we really are objectively the greatest country on earth, that we're just the smartest smart boys around and that everyone else is just being big mad about it. And we want to believe that if it's not working, it actually totally does work in theory and it's just that there are some people who are fucking it all up for us. Everything would be working perfectly if it wasn't for a few bad actors in positions of power. Traditional values, conventional masculinity, family values, the American dream, Christian morality, the Protestant work ethic, these are the rules of the supposed natural order of things, and by forsaking them, we're making everything fall apart and letting the wrong people be in charge, letting the people who cater to the less deserving be in charge. But would it really work better if we adhered to all that? Was there actually ever some hypothetical ideal world where everything was as it should be? Because when you actually kind of spell out a lot of their beliefs, it comes out pretty bleak. And when you look at actual history, it sure doesn't seem like that hypothetical Camelot age of perfect order was ever a thing. Albion, Shambhala, 
Xanadu, Shangri-La, Arcadia, Eden, Atlantis, and 1950s Leave it to Beaver, they're all fairy tales of idealized pasts that never existed. It's all just revisionist history. The actual history is hardly devoid of needless strife and unjust cruelty. We're romanticizing a past that doesn't deserve it. I could give endless examples, but let's just use me and my generation to illustrate. I'm 33, by the way. Uh, me and my peers are old enough now to start complaining about back pain and young people's music that annoys us. And that means we're looking back at our childhoods with rose-tinted glasses. Too many of us are acting like it was just 2016 where everything went to hell. But let's just take a quick look at all the shit that was happening in the world in the few decades prior to then that most of us glossed over because we were all just dumb adolescents thoroughly engrossed with our Pokemon cards and the good seasons of Spongebob. Let's see, we had... <gasps> The AIDS Crisis, Iran-Contra, Desert Storm, Rwandan Genocide, The Defense of Marriage Act, Monica Lewinsky, The Patriot Act, 9-11, The War in Afghanistan, The Iraq War, Hurricane Katrina, The 2008 Financial Crisis, The Westboro Baptist Church, Obama's Drone Strikes, The Sandy Hook Shootings, Trayvon Martin, The BP Oil Spill, Benghazi, Hey, we didn't start the fire! There's a hundred other things that could be listed that you and I all forgot about because we devoted that brain space to the X Games and Halo teabaggings. The world was never normal, but that fact hardly matters to the people trying to sell you on making things great again. According to them, the world used to be good, used to be just and true and natural, but that natural order has been subverted. The weak now prey upon the strong, but they want to take us back to those bygone glory days where the strong were in charge and everything was right with the world. And these struggles that you face are the result of your natural position of strength having been stolen from you. A lot of this kind of rhetoric kind of centers around overly romanticized ideas of the past. Traditional gender roles, rigid hierarchies, might makes right philosophies, very literal understandings of social Darwinism, and often a near deified view of wealth and capital. And if all of that sounds like a big pile of poorly reasoned, self-destructive, boneheaded, and hey, now that I think about it, oddly familiar ideas, there's a reason for that. So let's just take a few paragraphs to describe the ideal world according to this ideology of meritocracy and a just world. And just for a bit of fun, let's employ the Conan the Barbarian narrator voice, an impression of the late, great Makoto Iwamatsu while doing so. The world is naturally harsh and cruel, and there's nothing wrong with it being like that. If you want something, you have to take it. If you're the one doing the taking, that's because you're strong and therefore deserve it. If you're the one being taken from, you're weak and therefore deserve it. If you endure the constant taking and grow strong enough to take back, that's good. That's how it is for animals, so obviously that's how it should be for people too. People are no different than animals. The world is a fiery crucible, meant to forge strength, and therefore it's good that harsh reality has cast your might and resolve like unto iron. Complaining about it, having emotions about it, that way lies weakness. Those who are good are good because they are strong. Those who are strong are strong because they are good. Don't think too hard about it. The world is the way it is, so any attempt to change that is an attempt to subvert the forging of strength and is therefore going against the natural good. Making life easier is therefore dulling the iron of your strength. Intellect is strength and therefore good, but if it leads to a questioning of the intrinsic truth of the world, then it is bad, it is weakness masquerading as strength. Intellect comes in accepting the immutable, unchangeable laws of the universe, and questioning what is rather than adapting to it is weakness. Intellect should come in the form of clever handling of the blade, not clever handling of the book. The wise man rolls up his sleeves while the fool tries to avoid working. 
trickery is necessary for the fool to usurp power, because the weak can only gain power through deception. But strength is the only truth. Do only as your fathers have done, and how their fathers before them have done, and their fathers' fathers before them. True strength rejects modernity. Men who typically are born more predisposed to physical strength and rational thinking are therefore the rightful dominant party, and any qualities that can be associated with men should be regarded as qualities associated with strength and also goodness. Feminine qualities are therefore inferior, and any man displaying femininity is revealing his weakness. But that femininity is true to the nature of women, so they should embrace the truth of the natural order. Women, therefore, should not only be subservient, but any attempts to circumvent their subservience either indicates the weakness of the surrounding men or the wicked duplicity and snature of the woman. It is good for a woman to be feminine, to be subservient, because that serves to elevate the strength of the man. And therefore, the highest calling for manhood is the perpetuation of strength and the constant affirmation of said strength in glorious combat. So then, the highest calling of womanhood is to serve the man gladly and happily bear and rear strong sons for strong men. Therefore, the strongest of men will naturally select the most desirable of women for this end. Some men are naturally stronger than other men, and are therefore a caste of goodness above their fellows, giving them the noble obligation, the heaven-ordained privilege of ruling over those men who are lesser. Lesser men, left to their own devices, will fall to the temptations of weakness and will subvert the true and good order. Just as the woman is called to elevate the strength of men, so too are the weak men called to elevate the strength of the strong men. And the strongest of all men has been blessed by fate, ordained by the gods with the righteous entitlement of king. A king, being strongest, is therefore entitled to whatever luxury he might seize as his strength justifies it. It follows then that the fruit of the loins of the king would likewise be strong and entitled to rule. But should the monarchy bear weak sons, they will rightfully lose the throne to heaven's new chosen king after said new king usurps the throne. Should they fail to slay the god kings, this is just evidence that the current king is most fit to rule. After all, why would the gods, why would the natural world in all its natural righteousness permit the weak to flourish? Those who are weak exist only to support those who are strong. But a foolish samurai warrior wielding a magic sword. Okay, okay, enough. But anyways, you get it. It's all profoundly stupid and self-contradictory and utterly anachronistic. It's a self-sabotaging pig shit logic that if you lean on even slightly, it collapses. And if you try to apply it to today's world as a solution to the problems we face, you're just showing your ignorance. And wouldn't you know, it benefits the people who advocate for it most strongly because they're the ones already in charge. Of course they want this world. They want you to believe that they get to sit in the big boy chairs and tell everyone what's what because they just worked harder than everyone else. Because if you believe it, you'll work harder for them hoping to get your chance to sit in the big boy chair. So many people think they can just anime protagonists themselves into being a billionaire, into being on top. But is that really all that good of a system? And as I've said before, even if it were the natural order of things, which it isn't, alpha males aren't a thing that occur with wolves, David Mech, who popularized the idea, has since tried to correct his old research, dominance hierarchy exists in some animals but not all, and that's not a reason to apply that model to humans though, human beings are social animals, cooperation is actually a way better system, etc, etc. Even if it were the natural order of things, I don't actually give a shit. I don't actually care what people used to do 100, 200, 500 years ago. 
Most of the people who lived 500 years ago fucking died somewhere between the age of 16 and 35. Imagine yourself at 16 trying to hunt deer in the same ecosystem where bears habitate, and imagine doing so with a spear instead of a gun and no Carhartt coats. Imagine being impressed that your 20-year-old brother died on the battlefield in service to some fat, inbred, Joffrey Baratheon-style king who sent all the able-bodied young men to fight in some far-off land because some other fat, inbred king called him a pussy in a letter. The only reason Leonidas didn't spend his nights and weekends playing Diablo is because there weren't any fucking video games at the time. Otherwise, he probably would have been playing it. You know, if he could have fit playing it into his busy schedule of raping Spartan boys. Oh yeah, that's real by the way. Links in the description. And that's links, plural, as in multiple sources reaffirming each other. The Spartans would fuck their own young boys while away at war. Their women would have to shave their heads so as to appear enough like little boys that the men would find them appealing. It was part of the Spartans' absolutely brutal societal training regimen called the Agogi that had Spartan boys leaving home at seven to be stripped naked, beaten, starved, tortured, exposed to the elements, and encouraged to fight each other as a means of making them as tough and as callous as possible. They were literally expected to steal food in order to survive, but also punish severely if caught as a means of teaching them rugged individualism. At age 12, they were assigned to an older Spartan male for personal apprenticeship and encouraged to sleep in the same bed to foster affection for each other. Now, it wasn't explicitly stated that the older ones were meant to have sex with their charges, but they were forbidden from interacting with women until age 30 which would be another reason for women to shave their heads, so, you know, they could sneak into camp and meet someone. But, uh, yeah, you know, a bunch of dudes, frustrated from a long day of violently plunging their long spears into their shuddering enemies, and now they have to get cuddly with underdressed kids. You do the math. Spartan boys turn seven, no more video games or nuggies, no more loving, nurturing home life. At this point, they're just basically trying to kill you and rape you, with the logic being that if you don't die, then you must be tough enough to do the same to someone else. The movie 300 just glossed over that little detail, huh? They actually tried to hand wave it away with some throwaway line about Athenians being boy lovers, which, yeah, probably also true, Greece was incredibly homoerotic. But it obviously wasn't always in healthy ways, and the Spartans weren't innocent either. It's just that that little historical fact gets in the way of your oorah macho man movie experience, as does the fact that there were other factions who joined the Spartan 300 in Thermopylae, around 5,000 to 6,000 total Greeks, and yet they still fucking lost. Pretty alpha, right? What, they did it 2,500 years ago, don't you want to embrace tradition? Shaving women and sex with boys was good enough for the Spartans, who were supposedly history's greatest warriors. Shouldn't that be good enough for you? Do you think that being routinely sodomized by muscly men every day until you were of age was the secret to their great prowess in battle, or were they just full of themselves? I don't know, if you're aspiring to be a real-life Goku, you probably can't afford to totally rule it out in case routinely being brutally assaulted by giant, battle-frenzied men is the secret edge to your masculinity that you need to be stronger, am I right? Although, to be clear, they didn't get any military training until about age 20. So until then, it was just having to steal food, getting beaten up, and getting molested. So there you have it, if you were curious about where the Berserk manga gets its ideas from. And many scholars suggest that it didn't necessarily make them better warriors, they were just more rigidly disciplined and organized. The training didn't turn you into some kind of uber badass super soldier, it just made you into a mindless drone who would do whatever you were told without complaint or question. It was to strip you of your free will and convince you that your only role in society was to serve as a good little Spartan soldier in the interest of the state without daring to dream of anything better until you died in battle or were allowed to retire at age 60. You were Sparta's bitch and that's all you were. And once you were too old to be an effective bitch, maybe then they'd let you use what precious little time you have left to do what you want. 
And you know what other society really liked how Sparta was run? The fucking Nazis. Yep, this is 100% accurate. Dude by the name of Karl Uttfried Müller introduced Germany to this love for Spartans that tied neatly into racist sentiments, and little Adolf thought that was just nifty keen. And boy, doesn't that make a whole lot of sense. A whole historical precedent for pedocon theory. And there you go, you're now sufficiently red-pilled on the Chad and Alpha past that everyone likes to romanticize. You can look through history and any seemingly ideal past that you find probably wasn't so when you actually peel back the layers. What is and isn't acceptable is arbitrarily decided by who's in control now, and there's usually a good reason things get left in the past. Do you think the people of the past who fought so hard to overcome the injustices heaped upon them so that you could have a more comfortable life intended for you, their descendants, to say, Life was actually way better back when left-handed people were considered mentally inferior to right-handed people and when cars had no seatbelts and ran on leaded gasoline. This isn't a new philosophy either. I'm sure if you went back far enough, you'd find some bitter, miserable old bastard who thought that using rifles instead of a bow and arrow to hunt for food was exactly what was wrong with this new generation. Bet he was real mad too that everyone was building little wooden huts to answer nature's call in, rather than stepping outside of their caves during a blizzard to squat shit in a bush and wipe with their hands before being attacked by mountain lions. Is that the great you want to make again? Why is that not part of the great, but the other stuff is? It's because the rules of what great is, is decided by the people whom it benefits. And of course, people for whom the old ways were great, the Spartans who got to rape little boys, they're going to want to maintain that and convince you that it's not only better that way, but that everything else different is bad, actually. Hey, can I ask you a question? Can I... Can I fuck you in the asshole? Do you want to be my little Spartan boy? Consensually, of course. Just for one night. No? How about for a hundred dollars? Still no? How about for a hundred thousand dollars? Still no? Ten million dollars. Are we getting close? I know for a lot of us, it probably wouldn't have even taken a hundred K. Now, I have a rule. I don't like things going into my anus outside of medical necessity. Call me a prude if you will, but it's not generally something I'm eager to experience. And if I were to accept guests into my rectum, it would probably only be special honored guests whom I personally grant permission to for the sake of our mutual gratification and not just any old stranger on the street who takes a fancy. But for $50,000? 40000 Even 15000 that could do a lot of good for me and my family. Could fix or replace some broken, rundown stuff that we rely on that isn't cheap. A neat 20 or 30 grand could materially benefit us in a not insubstantial way. My rules are bendable for sufficient cash. I would rent out this sphincter for the night for somewhere in the low tens of thousands of dollars, I'm not gonna lie. And that's kind of fucked up that I'm willing to trade something I wouldn't normally continence, something I wouldn't otherwise willingly choose, in the hopes that I might marginally improve my life, all because someone is holding something over me that I can't afford to totally disregard. How many other rules in our world do you think have price tags? And right there, we see a little crack in the idea that the rule of law is being determined by merit because the rules can shift depending on the quote-unquote merit. We all need money, because money is how we determine merit. A lot of rules when you break them or are found to have been in violation of them have penalties that come in the form of fines, of money owed for crimes committed. And if you know you've got lots of money, you don't fear being caught having broken these rules. Maybe you'd even break them knowing you can afford the punishment. If hypothetically you could get out of a traffic ticket by doing algebra problems without the use of a calculator, there'd be an awful lot of math gurus speeding while everyone else who struggles with math problems would probably be towing the line a little more carefully, right? You might then think that some of these rules exist specifically to keep the arithmetically challenged in line while the whiz kids can have free reign of the road. 
Maybe the people who got into fancy private schools with all the best teachers and resources could just be absolute jackasses on the road. Same thing with rules where the punishment is money. Those who can pay the fines, no sweat, only really have the honor system to hold them accountable to the same rules that all the rest of us have to obey because we can't afford the fines. Or hey, even if the punishment isn't a fine, if you can afford really good lawyers who can find all the best loopholes and legal defenses, maybe you're less worried about the consequences. The rule of law has a price tag. We're able to be punished for being poor, we're not poor because we get punished so much. And maybe if breaking the rules has no real consequence for you because you're rich, maybe you'd just develop a total contempt for the rules as they apply to you. Maybe you'd stop worrying about the consequences of all your actions, because no matter how careless and stupid and hateful and hurtful you are, everything turns out okay for you. You start feeling entitled to do anything you want. But you can still use other people breaking the rules as a means to criticize them when you don't like them. And let's face it, the wealthy often will deliberately break the rules because they know that despite having to monetarily pay for their crimes, they still make way more money for having broken the rules. Hey, uh, how do you get money? You work for it, right? Well, not actually. I mean, you can. That certainly will get you some money. But like... Children don't start working for a while, though probably they will if certain politicians have their way. Uh, but uh, children get the stuff that they need to buy through their parents. That's typically considered a pretty standard thing, right? Giving money to the people close to you whom you care about when they can't yet get it themselves. That flies in the face of our little meritocracy beliefs, but we're generally okay with this exception. I mean, you can't take it with you when you die, right? Might as well give it to your kids. And if you have a lot of money, then your kids start off with a lot of money, right? Money you can just give them whenever they really need it because they'll probably end up with all or most of it when you die anyways, and hey, you love the little stinkers, right? So what happens when kids have parents who have way more money than other people? Let's say their parents own a sapphire mine in apartheid Afri- um, sorry, not, uh, Apartheid Antarctica, yeah, that's the ticket, yeah. Or maybe you're the son of some big New York City real estate magnate. No, not not New York, um, Honolulu. A Honolulu real estate magnate. Doesn't it follow that some kids are going to start out with easier or harder lives for themselves through no merit or fault of their own simply by luck of the draw? Like some people's parents will be struggling to keep food in the cupboard and lights on in the house while other people will have the means to buy anything and everything they could ever want and need to accomplish any number of goals and you have no way of knowing which of those you're going to be born into. And that's assuming you're born and stay able-bodied and able-minded because that's something else that could happen through no fault of your own, being made less capable of making money through conventional means some kind of mental illness, some kind of physical ailment, some kind of disability, some kind of birth defect, any of which could hurt your ability to get or keep a job, making you less capable of merit. Not because of something you did, but because of bad luck. Or let's face it, pretty standard luck, because the number of people whose lives start with completely ideal conditions are far outweighed by the number of people whose lives don't. Couldn't then those people who were born with lots of wealth then maintain or increase that wealth to pass on to their children? Meanwhile, those born without then have a harder time accumulating more to pass on to their children. Doesn't that mean that some people are simply inheriting their merits from their parents or their grandparents or their great grandparents or beyond, while others are inheriting debt? Doesn't that too kind of fly in the face of meritocracy? When the merit, or lack thereof, could be the result of someone's actions from so far back that you might not even know them and certainly aren't responsible for their actions. And then we're expected to believe that those conditions are deserved because us or our parents didn't do enough of the right things rather than them simply having been yet another generation in a long line of people with apartheid Antarctic sapphire money. 
Well, surely, D. Biddles, you're not suggesting that the children born to wealthy families should have that wealth taken from them. Surely you, hypothetical viewer, are not suggesting that the children born to poorer income families deserve to have less opportunities and more hardship. Surely you're not suggesting that the only way to be fair to people who have more is to ensure the suffering of those who have less. Surely there are far, far, far more children born to poverty than there are to wealth. Surely more equitable distributions of wealth and resources would ensure less starving children. Surely you are not trying to justify the struggle of so many, many children for the sake of the few lucky ones who are born to parents who can just casually loan them a million dollars to start Amazon, which is the world's most successful online commerce site. And if my suggestion is unfair, I actually think I'm okay with that. I think I'm okay with trading the opportunity for a small few people getting to be billionaires for the opportunity for all children to no longer need fear being hungry or unhoused. And do those wealthy parents or grandparents or whoever actually deserve that fabulous wealth in the first place? Like I said, we tend to be very suspect of people who seem to do unscrupulous things in pursuit of higher earnings, and I don't think that's unwarranted. How do you get money? Well, conventional wisdom says you work for it. But even by hustling harder than you have to, there's a plateau of earning that you eventually run into, right? I mean, let's be real here for a second. The wealthiest people out there aren't doctors or scientists or teachers or engineers or artists or athletes. Those folks are wealthier than many of us, but not usually so much so that they're untouchable. The wealthiest people around are just businessmen. They're people who buy and sell and invest in things. They invest in companies that provide goods and services that other people have to actually physically make and do for them. You can bust ass and come up with good ideas and do your damnedest to provide the best service you're capable of, but there's still a limit to how much money you can earn, even assuming that you don't run into any obstacles, am I right? I mean, we all bust our goddamn asses at work. We all sweat and bleed and cry way more than we should have to at our jobs in order to get the meager allowances afforded to us. It'd be really, really astronomically difficult for me, starting out as I did in middle-class white suburbia, to find myself a billionaire in this lifetime, even if I gave up interpersonal relationships and personal gratification and the like. It would be really difficult to do that, even without Starbucks, avocado toast, student loan debt, and Netflix. You want to know how I know? Because I sure don't get Starbucks or avocado toast on the regular. I never had any student loan debt, and prior to living with my wife, I didn't have Netflix either. And if I was a billionaire, You'd know, because my audio and video quality wouldn't be so fucking garbage at the very least. It's especially hard to get fabulously wealthy if you're following all the rules, right? I mean, we established earlier that rules can change when money gets involved. Surely getting rich would be a lot easier if I broke a few laws that I didn't get caught for, or if I paid people to look the other way on my law breaking or if I took a calculated risk on getting caught breaking the law knowing I could pay the penalties, or if I did immoral things that there weren't laws against yet that eventually get laws made for them after I've profited a whole lot, or if I paid to lobby a few legislatures who make laws to preemptively change some laws, or if I paid a lawyer a bunch of money to find legal loopholes that let me get away with things, or if I deceived people into giving me money under false pretenses, or if I did things that ultimately hurt people but that saved me money on cost. Boy, all of that would be a great way to get a lot richer a lot quicker, wouldn't it? Tune in for future episodes of Chatbots where we'll discuss how the rich get richer through very unsavory means. Well, 
Yeah, but if people knew you did that bad stuff, they wouldn't want to do business with you anymore or give you money, right? Surely you can't be that naive, can you, viewer? Surely you can't truly believe that all, or even most, of the ultra-successful people out there have gotten to the top with entirely, or even mostly, legal, moral, and ethical practices, can you? Surely you can't believe that there aren't millions of very public scandals that are tied to any number of powerful people and institutions that are public record, but we can't or won't do hardly anything about them. Surely we wouldn't forget child slave labor being used to harvest lithium and cocoa, or Appalachian company towns, or Chinese sweatshops, or auto company stock buybacks, or Coca-Cola employing Colombian death squads to break trade unions. Surely we wouldn't be so willfully blind when we so clearly live in a world that doesn't have a great track record for preventing illegal, immoral, and unethical practices. Where a lot of people very clearly seek out bad things because those bad things are wildly profitable. That just world thing is pretty clearly bullshit, right? We've all seen a million examples of this, not just of the system being unfair, but of the universe just bending you over a table for no particular reason. Tree falls on your car when you're just starting to get your shit together. A good person dies young from disease because they can't afford treatment. A working class family is crushed by debt in trying to treat a sick family member. Veterans come home from a war they didn't start and didn't profit from to find themselves abandoned by the country they served. But we're always so distrustful of poor people when they're trying to get money. We're always so willing to assume the worst and be uncharitable to poor people who might be trying to get money through socially questionable or less than legal means. Homeless person begging for money? Oh, they'll just use it to buy drugs. Probably why they're homeless. Someone trying to shoplift? Just some scumbag. What could they possibly want with three Nintendo Switches? Someone doing sex work or OnlyFans. Loose moral harlot, preying off of men. Poor artists and buskers. Get a real job, you lazy bum. Poor person using food stamps. They just keep leeching off my tax dollars for fudge rounds and popping out babies. Immigrants here illegally doing day labor? Trying to ruin our country, bringing crime and drugs to our neighborhood. I don't know. Maybe those people aren't all that evil. Maybe times are just that hard that this is the best they can do with their bad situation. Maybe this attitude is just a means by which we can feel better about ourselves and our pitiful status in the hierarchy by saying, Well, at least I'm not as pathetic as these disgusting losers. Maybe that attitude is just a way for the people in charge to legitimize marginalizing and oppressing people by telling you those people are all evil and bad and lazy, by telling you those people are to blame for your problems. After all, if you don't do what the people in charge say, you could end up in the same place as those incredibly unfortunate people. And you wouldn't want to be homeless, would you? So shut up! Shut up and make $9 lattes and be grateful the rich people give you a whole $12 an hour to do it. But suppose the poor are being a little deceptive or immoral to get that money. I don't know, they hardly seem like they're doing all that great if they're settling for penny ante scams and schemes like that to get by. I mean, if it helps, you can think of it as a modern day agogi where you're expected to steal in order to survive, but they'll definitely punish you if you get caught. You know, if they were really getting away with some big old schemes, they probably wouldn't still need to be doing this kind of shit. No one rattling cups by the bus stop is thriving. Maybe they're getting by, maybe they're even able to afford a few luxuries, but it's not like they're making more than even us minimum wage laborers. And if they are, I feel like we should be getting mad at the people giving us such low wages that someone with a cardboard sign can outperform us. If they really got a decent amount of money from it, 
they could probably start investing in the stock market, or at least be able to afford a trailer home so that they didn't have to spend all day doing demeaning things and getting spat on. There's a lot of way less humiliating methods to get away with lounging around all day while other people work hard to carry your worthless ass, and most of them involve boardroom conference calls, yachts, watching the Dow Jones, and golfing. We're all struggling and doing shit we normally wouldn't just to put food on the table, just to afford a few treats like the occasional Xbox game, or a new pair of shoes that doesn't have holes in them, or a car that has functional AC and doesn't double as your primary residence. Rich people don't have to resort to little cons to get money though. But they're always quick to blame welfare queens and immigrants and small-time criminals for all the problems in the world. Isn't that amazing? A few marginalized folks who have to turn tricks or shoplift to make rent are capable of ruining the whole goddamn world for everyone. Meanwhile, rich and powerful people do awful things all the time and everybody knows about it because it makes headlines, but they get away with it anyways. And we just keep assuming that these rich people deserve to be on top. They deserve to have everyone forget about their huge, terrible atrocities that they committed along the way because some poor person was trying to shoplift earrings from the department store. Obviously, if the son of the Honolulu real estate magnate had done something wrong, he'd have been arrested, handcuffed, and put into a police car, like that shoplifter was. They always get the benefit of the doubt, don't they? And boy, are we seeing a lot of shitty, dumb, terrible people do a lot of really heinous stuff and then not get punished for it. Not just in secret, but loudly and proudly on the evening news. When you've lived without consequences for long enough, any amount of pushback seems like persecution. Hell, half the time they can convince people, not all people, but enough of them, they can convince them that it's actually fine that they did those terrible things. They just have to use a little of that mastermind strategy known as DARVO. Deny, attack, reverse, victim, and offender. Also known as the NO YOU strategy. It goes a little something like this. Step 1. Establish fake credibility for yourself with your massive unearned success so that very stupid, very insecure people will think you're talented instead of just lucky. Don't be afraid to be really loud and obnoxious. Because if you're good looking or wealthy enough or if you put on a facade of confidence and intellect, people will be more likely to believe it. Step 2. Brag about how this credibility has made you super popular so that the aforementioned dumb people will have the validation of unseen and possibly non-existent masses further lending credence to your unearned value. After all, if there's seemingly all these people who think you're cool, insecure people won't want to miss out on what you have. Never mind that you're just wealthy enough to advertise yourself more than others, it must just be that you're actually really cool. Step 3. Offer to sell these dumbos the keys to emulating your success because you're just such a cool guy and you feel bad for all these poor rubes. Bear in mind, your success comes from luck and from taking advantage of vulnerable dipshits. They will likely never emulate your results, but that's good, because if they did, they wouldn't need you anymore. If they ask why it isn't working, just tell them they didn't do it right. They're on the right track, but they just need to hustle more. Or you could say that someone else is working against them, and that leads to... Step 4. Accuse anyone who criticizes you of being stupid and lazy and jealous and a big smelly beta male cuck. In fact, call them out as being part of the sinister agenda that's keeping people like your fans from being successful like you. Maybe also insinuate that they're like pedophiles or demon possessed or are secretly blood drinking lizard people. Or better yet, some combination of that. Anyone who doesn't like you is working for the devil and also probably definitely rapes children. That's the secret to their success, but not yours. They definitely did something bad to get where they are, but not you. You never touch those Spartan boys. Step 5. Preemptively warn your new fan base that all those stupid, jealous, wojack losers are out to get you and that they'll stop at nothing to make up lies about you and take you down because they're threatened by all the truth-telling that you do. 
After all, you're the one pointing out that they're lazy and stupid and probably definitely devil-worshipping baby rapists. Don't believe anything they've got to say. Step 6. Freely admit to doing horrible, terrible things, but frame them as good things actually, despite them being legally and ethically objectionable. After all, you're cool and smart and successful, right? So anything you do must be good, and so too must your reasoning for doing those things. Maybe it's how you got to be so awesome. But anyone else who does those same bad things is actually bad because they're bad and when they do it, it's bad. Why are people mad about you doing bad things when that bad person over there who isn't as cool as you is doing those same bad things? I bet that person's not making anything great again. Probably definitely because they're too busy hurting children. Step 7. When you inevitably start to see consequences for your actions, attribute that to your made-up conspiracy about the cabal of jealous, soy-faced, demonic child molesters, thereby looking very smart for having predicted this reaction. They suck and they hate you, and you called it. Step 8. Convince your followers that the conspiracy is coming for them next, and since they'll likely be trying to emulate your behaviors, that prediction will also come true. You'll look smart, and your fans will become totally paranoid and resistant to reason from outside forces. But reassure them that things are totally under control so long as they stick to what you taught them. Success is just around the corner for them. Step 9. Never let an opportunity to profit go to waste. Have your fans send you money to help fight back against the sinister forces that have unfairly maligned you and claim that you're using it to fight on their behalf. Since you're already scamming them for money at this point, they'll probably feel extra motivated to help you out, you know, since you've been so kind as to help them. At this point, giving to you and defending you in the comments section is just part of how they feel better about things. If any of that sounds familiar, it's because it's a simplified version of the cult leader's playbook, and versions of this strategy have been employed by any number of history's biggest scumbags, from Jim Jones and Charles Manson to Hitler and Stalin. Just foster a parasocial codependence from a bunch of insecure people and then point them in the direction of some external force. Point out that a few things are legitimately untrustworthy, Use that fact to discredit everyone and everything, and now that everything is a lie, make sure that your followers know that only you and those who agree with your ludicrous claims are the only ones who they should believe to be trustworthy. Don't trust school, don't trust science, don't trust the media, don't trust loved ones. They're all either part of or influenced by evil forces who are out to get everyone. Everyone's lying to you except me, and now that I'm telling the truth, they're trying to shut me up because they don't want you to know the truth that I have to tell. Look how easy it is to have a monopoly on the quote-unquote truth. But hey, it doesn't need to be contained to singular figures. You can use this method to prop up any number of institutions, from militaries to religions to government to all forms of social hierarchies. This meritocracy shit sure seems like a great way to prop up authoritarianism. And this pretending we live in a just world shit seems like a great way to let a lot of injustice go unpunished. Well, what about Joe Biden and Hunter Biden? What about the pay for play and the laptop from hell and the Twitter files? What about Hillary's emails? What about Russia, Russia, Russia? What about Epstein's book? What about Nancy Pelosi and Bill Gates and George Soros and Hillary Clinton? And you know what, viewer? Fuck them. Fuck them all. Fuck those people. Throw them to the wolves. Tie them to a railroad track. Lock them up and throw away the key. Fire them into the goddamn sun. Let everyone on earth line up and take turns punching them in the genitals. I don't care. I don't like these people. I don't trust these people. I feel I've made it very clear I distrust authority. It's no secret that there's lots of dirty money out there in government, in the corporate world, controlling most or all facets of our society, and I'm wary of all of it. Why shouldn't I be? We've created a system where money makes the rules and money breaks the rules. Our meritocracy is based on the false premise that money equates to merit. 
that power is justice and that anyone trying to subvert that is going to ruin everything. And I think that money should be taken completely out of the equation. I feel like not only is it allowing for bad people to do what they want, but it's preventing lots and lots and lots of ordinary people from getting the things they need to survive, all because we pretend they just don't fucking deserve it. All because we have to protect the natural order of things. Have to pretend like the way things are is the way they've always been and need to continue being. I feel we should be very justifiably suspicious of people with too much money because they very likely broke the rules in acquiring that money and or after becoming wealthy. So you want to investigate all your least favorite liberals? Sure man, let's investigate everyone earning seven figures or more. I've got no problem with that. But if we're going to do that, we're going to have to investigate some of your faves too. Mitch McConnell, Ted Cruz, Marjorie Taylor Greene, Matt Gates, Ron DeSantis, Jared Kushner, Elon Musk, Mike Johnson, Eric and Don Jr. None of them get passes, dipshit. Meritocracy isn't okay just because you like some of the people it benefits. And I think that there's some people who have done some very obvious and blatant stuff that we barely have to investigate to find proof of. I think there's some people for whom you'd actually have to work really hard or else completely disregard reality in order to find evidence of their innocence, to find evidence that they're really as cool and as wonderful as they'd like us to believe. And we shouldn't be hesitating to hold them accountable just because we like them. Because they'd never extend the same grace and leniency to us. They're cucking you with this meritocracy shit. It's all just a lie to justify marginalization and oppression. It's all just a lie to justify a few people having nearly everything while the rest of us have practically nothing. It's all just a lie to keep you believing that you don't deserve better than this life. Bro's just mad he can't cut it in the real world and so he's trying to change the rules so that he can... Idiot! Idiot! You just said it! There are no fucking rules! We made it up! We made everything up! That's why I reject this whole natural argument, because none of this stuff is real. Religion, politics, laws, economics, social expectations, fate, destiny, hierarchy... It's all bullshit! It doesn't grow on trees or fall like rain. We had to invent it all! Money's not real, we made it up. Just like we made up mortgages, credit scores, 401ks, taxes, business loans, the stock market, insurance payments, every last one of them is just some dumb rule we made up. Why are you so committed to being someone else's little Spartan boy? Is it a kink thing? Don't let me shame you if being used is your kink, but even kink needs consent, and none of us signed up for this shit. You think you're gonna grow up to be the one with the big muscles, a big spear, and the ability to fuck whoever you want? You're not shit for brains. Odds are good you're just gonna be a Spartan boy for your entire life. It's all just some stupid make-believe dumbfuck game that we're all playing. The rules are made up and the points don't matter. People are the only real part of all of this. People are the only thing that matter here. We make the rules to serve us, not to serve the rules. Some of our rules are good, some of them are bad, some of them are just benign, some of them serve us, some of them used to be good enough but aren't anymore, and some of them were never good. The rules should be made to benefit the majority of us and not the minority. The rules should exist to promote freedom, safety, prosperity, and happiness. It's not supposed to be a competitive game because everyone ends up equally dead at the end. It's supposed to be a cooperative game. So unless those rules are doing something for us, Let's pitch them and make some new ones. And the only people who actually like these rules are either the people on the top or the people who have fooled themselves into thinking that they'll be on top one day. You want to keep pretending meritocracy is worthwhile? Stop giving the benefit of the doubt to all the most powerful people. Start scrutinizing and criticizing the fuck out of them, especially when it's pretty obvious how terrible some of them are. I mean, Fuck, if they're so great, they can probably handle some policy changes that work against them. Let's see how tough these guys are without corporate bailouts. Let's see how they handle stricter business regulations, trust busting, higher income tax for the wealthy, 
crackdowns on insider trading, and also capital gains tax. Let's see how they handle term limits, greater checks and balances, easier impeachment proceedings, an inability to lobby financial backers for political support, and more severe punishments for breaking the public trust when you've got greater wealth and authority. You're such a badass? No more easy mode. We're making the game harder for you now. Mario Kart Blue Shell Philosophy. Welcome to expert difficulty, bitch. Show us what you got. And if we're ready to admit that maybe the world isn't as just as we like to pretend, we need to start helping out those less fortunate, either by dropping a few alms in their open hands without criticizing them, or by enacting policies that uplift everyone. Universal housing, universal healthcare, free college, funding infrastructure and revitalization, free drug rehab, free accommodations to those with disabilities, higher minimum wages, labor unions, restorative justice to marginalized communities, increased voting rights and voter accessibility. We can't consent to being governed by those with merit if they've all got knives to our throats threatening to cut if we aren't of sufficient merit to them. And we can't do anything but suffer and die in endless, meaningless conflict if we're allowing those with merit to send us off in olive drab tin cans to struggle on their behalf, all while they promise us that if we're really, really special, maybe we can be the ones in charge someday. Hey, uh, thanks for watching. This one's probably my longest video, hope I did it justice. Hey, you know what else is a shitty, unjust, fickle meritocracy? The YouTube algorithm. Why don't you help me fight back by liking, commenting, subscribing, and ringing the notifications bell? Maybe you could also check out those other videos I mentioned earlier in the video? Or maybe just watch any and all of my content. Boosting my view count? That's another great way to fight back against systemic algorithmic oppression. I also have a Ko-fi in the description of all my videos if you feel so inclined. Donations are appreciated, but not necessary. I'll keep doing what I'm doing either way. Speaking of, here's who we've got for the next episode. Looks rad, right? Tune in to see this one get built. Anyways, uh, I'm D. Biddles, this was Chatbots. Sayonara bye bye!